Uh, great to be with you all today. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for joining us in worship, whether you're here in person or whether you're following along online. We're so grateful that you have tuned in to the Springs this morning. Uh, I hope everyone is enjoying summertime as well and uh, maybe tolerating this wonderful Missouri heat, right? Uh, it's only just beginning, but we're thankful for a morning like this that's at least a little bit cooler, a little break from the heat. Uh, but what a blessing it is to gather together this morning to be able to worship Jesus. Um, as Aaron said, my name is Trent Moberly, and I serve as the student pastor here at the Springs. And grateful to Aaron as well for how he was willing to step in um, and help lead the worship team this morning. Grateful for all of them and how um, they led us. Um, and so, yeah, Zach and Cameron are enjoying a little bit of time away, and so we're blessed to be able to serve and help lead the service this morning. And so, as we get started, I just want to say that uh, I'm here learning um, from God's Word just as much as any of you all, and it's always a joy to have the opportunity to lead us in reflecting on the Word of God together, and so I'm excited for what God has to say to each of our hearts here this morning. And so this summer, we've been working through um, a section of passages from book two of the Psalms. We've just recently began this series. And so if you missed some of those, feel free to go back and check those out online. You can um, look th- uh, for our podcast, our website, or even our YouTube to catch up on this series, um, which we're calling God's Playlist. And so Pastor Tom last week did an excellent job walking us through a very heavy Psalm 51, um, which uh, a repentant David seeks, af- seeks God's forgiveness and his redemption. But this week, we'll take a look at another psalm of David with a weighty feel to it, but that comes in very different circumstances from earlier in his life. So as we get started, would you join me in prayer as we begin? Jesus, we come before you today looking for your guidance. We look to you knowing that you desire to lead us and care for us in the same way a shepherd tends to his flock. As we learn together from your word today, may it further our longing for you, deepen our love of you, and increase our devotion to you. May it be a lamp to guide our feet and a light for our path as we go from here to live as your followers, bearing your good news to a world that needs you just as desperately as we do. Speak to our hearts now, Lord. We ask this in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. So, part of the human experience, inevitably, is wrestling with various fears that we have, right? Some very understandable, even necessary and healthy fears. Some that come from times of danger or distress. While others are more puzzling at why they give us a sense of fear. Often, fears can get grouped in today's terms of rational or irrational fears. And one fear that I had personally when I was a kid that fell much more into the latter category was a character from a sci-fi movie that I watched. It's what you would consider an older movie now at this point. So some of you that are younger may not recognize this character, but here he is. (laughs) E.T. E.T. is short for extraterrestrial, if you didn't know. And this is really, the movie is a story of this bizarre looking alien who comes to earth and befriends a young boy and his family. And really, it's a heartwarming movie, right? If you've seen it, you know what I'm talking about. It's a, it's a classic Steven Spielberg film. And so I actually really enjoyed the movie. But something about E.T. just freaked me out. <laughs> I couldn't shake this fear of this little fictional alien and just thought he was super creepy even if I wouldn't admit it to anyone at the time. So hopefully you're not judging me too much now. I was so creeped out by this little guy that I would have nightmares and picture him in my room, which would almost feel paralyzing with how afraid I would get. It was the kind of freezing fear that would feel overwhelming and controlling to me. And to this day, what baffled me about this fear is that I had so many reasons to rationalize why this wasn't something to be afraid of. It's clearly a fictional alien character, for starters, who, even if he were real, was actually very friendly in the movie and would mean me no harm whatsoever. Yet, this very real, visceral fear was still there for a younger version of me. This morning, though, the psalm that we are going to look at was written in the face of some very real, much more frightening circumstances that prompted the psalmist to cry out to the Lord for help in the midst of his fear. What the Lord gave us the opportunity to learn from this psalm today is a response from David to the intense fear that he was facing at that time in his life. So a little bit of background on this psalm as we get going. 
This psalm is attributed to being written by King David, as I've mentioned, and most believe it to be written while he was a captive to the Philistines when they seized him in the city of Gath. And so a quick backstory for those who may not be as familiar with David and his story. To this point, David, the youngest of eight sons of Jesse, who was a humble shepherd boy, has been anointed by the prophet Samuel to succeed King Saul as the next king of Israel, not because of his impressive appearance or his royal lineage, but because of his heart. He is then invited to serve under Saul, who is unaware at this time of David's anointing. David then is empowered by God to overcome the giant Goliath. You're familiar with this story, notably the Philistines' finest warrior, who is from the city of Gath. Then fast forward, Saul gets incredibly jealous of David, feeling threatened by him as the future king, and becomes fearful of David and his threat to his throne. Notice how Saul is motivated by fear in pursuing David. And so because of this, Saul begins making attempts on David's life. And this prompts David to flee from Saul, run for his life, and he makes the mistake of going to Gath, seeking aid from the king there, and he is seized by the Philistines. And so as he's captive, they begin to recognize who he is. And we see these events recorded in 1 Samuel 21, 10, 15. If you want to read that later, go for it. So something worth noting about Gath as well is that, as I mentioned previously, this is the town where Goliath was from. So you can understand the justifiable source of the fear that David is feeling in the midst of such hostile enemies as he comes there, gets captured, and they begin to recognize him as David, the Israelite who killed their champion, Goliath. And to top it off, at that time, he is even carrying Goliath's sword. So a whole lot of reasons here to be afraid in these circumstances. And the psalm that we're gonna spend time studying this morning is then written by David with these circumstances in mind. And in it, we are given by the Lord an intimate glimpse into the anguished mind of David as he's a captive crying out to God for help in his time of need. What a privilege that we have the opportunity to learn together from David's example and see how the Lord wants us to respond rightly in the face of times of fear and distress that we might go through. It's a popular anecdote that the command God gives the most throughout Scripture is fear not. You may have heard that before. We see it all over the place in the Bible. But what this psalm offers us is a unique blueprint to learn from David specifically and how he sought God in faith in the midst of a time of great fear. So we're going to read the psalm together now. Um, It's Psalm 56. If you want to follow along in your own Bible, feel free to do so. Otherwise, we'll have the words on the screen for you to follow along there. Psalm 56. Be gracious to me, O God, for man tramples on me. All day long an attacker oppresses me. My enemies trample on me all day long, for many attack me proudly. When I'm afraid, I put my trust in you. In God, whose word I praise, in God I trust, I shall not be afraid. What can flesh do to me? All day long they injure my cause. All their thoughts are against me for evil. They stir up strife, they lurk, they watch my steps as they have waited for my life. For their crime will they escape? And wrath cast down the peoples, O God. You have kept count of my tossings. Put my tears in your bottle. Are they not in your book? Then my enemies will turn back in the day when I call. This I know that God is for me. In God, whose word I praise, in the Lord, whose word I praise, in God I trust, I shall not be afraid. What can man do to me? I must perform my vows to you, O God. I will render thank offerings to you, for you have delivered my soul from death. Yes, my feet from falling, that I may walk before God in the light of life. So as we look at this psalm this morning, we're going to look at it in three sections, okay? And we're going to examine each of them and see what we can learn from them, and then we'll conclude with some application. And so the first section is going to be verses one through four, and I'm just going to go ahead and read them again so that they're fresh on our minds as we dive into them. Be gracious to me, O God, for man tramples on me all day long, an attacker oppresses me. My enemies trample on me all day long, for many attack me proudly. When I am afraid, I put my trust in you. In God, whose word I praise, in God I trust, I shall not be afraid. What can flesh do to me? So what we notice right away is that David's heart posture is one that understands that God doesn't owe him anything. 
Despite being the Lord's anointed and the heir to the throne who is unjustly being pursued, he approaches the Lord in this desperate time asking for him to be gracious, to show him mercy. Be gracious to me, O God. This response seems to be counter to oftentimes the knee-jerk reaction that we experience when we're afraid. It comes a lot more naturally to us to hit the panic button, right? To be pridefully wondering, why us? Why we're facing this circumstance? Why is this fear here? And asking for the easy solution to the circumstances that we're facing. David is instead able to humbly come before the Lord even in the midst of deep fear. One thing that is worth noting is that this is clearly a response by David out of fear, not anxiety. David is responding to a perceived threat of the Philistines, which would be fear, while anxiety is worry about a threat that has not yet or may never occur. And so I say this knowing that anxiety is a very present struggle for many here. And while this is a response of David to fear, not anxiety, the same principles and how he responds to it may be a help in combating anxious thoughts as well. And so as we examine the psalm, I think that we can find some very practical, simple steps in facing fear David's way. There's even an acronym that I wanna share with you in the hopes that it might make it easier to memorize so that you can think of it later whenever you need it. And I know you note takers out there love a good acronym in a sermon, right? So the acronym is this, S-I-T, SIT. And the first part of it is this, set your mind on God. Set your mind on God. And so even as David lists how his enemies oppress and attack him, he doesn't allow the fear to overwhelm him, but he, in faith, chooses to look to God despite those fears. The words of Charles Spurgeon are very relevant here. The the open mouths of sinners when they rage against us should open our mouths in prayer. The response to the oppression of enemies is to pray, to look to God for aid. And I want to take a closer look at one of the key verses in this part of the passage, verse three. When I am afraid, I put my trust in you. And we're gonna kind of break it up into two halves there. When I am afraid. Notably, he is definitely admitting fear in the present moment. He's not gathering up this sort of false bravado of like, if something ever does happen to make me afraid, God. No, he knows that fear is a normal human emotion. Everyone feels fear, even David. And it's important to remember who David was. This wasn't a coward, this was a brave guy. He was a mighty warrior, he fought in many battles, he killed a lion, a bear, he faced and conquered Goliath. And this is the same guy that admitted here that he was afraid. So, David admits to the fear, he owns up to it, and knows that this is just one instance in his life where he's afraid and he's calling out to God. It isn't the first, and it won't be the last. When there's something that makes us afraid, we can have the instinct to respond in all kinds of ways, but this passage shows how David displayed faith in the face of fear. He says, I put my trust in you. Often, when we experience fear, we don't know what to do. We're kind of at a loss, right? We panic, we grasp at straws, we try to problem solve, but not David. David, in this instance, at least knew what to do. He knew that he needed God. He acknowledged his fears and knew that God was the only way to be freed from the grasp of the gripping fear that he was feeling. So fear is not the sole problem here, right? Fears are a part of life. They will inevitably come as we have circumstances that are understandably worthy of feeling afraid. He was rightly afraid in these circumstances. But even in the midst of those, it's our response to fear that is where the pitfalls can lie. Psychologists describe four potential responses in the human brain to fear. Two that you're probably more familiar with, fight or flight, but they also list two other potential responses, freeze or fawn. And I'm not gonna dive into all those or try to psychoanalyze David's response and see which one he was responding. Um, I'll let maybe some of you who are therapists or amateur therapists out there, I'll leave you to that. But what is interesting about his response is that he has a clear physical response recorded in 1 Samuel 21 where he pretends to be insane so that the Philistines will release him. 
And so we don't have insight into all the details of the timeline of how this all plays out and when he might have been writing this psalm and praying to God while captive. But it seems clear that even in the midst of these circumstances, he is calling out to God. He's asking for him to intervene, to act on his behalf, knowing that his exit options to get out of this predicament and be freed from the fear that he's feeling are very much out of his control. The danger when fear sets in is to let it be at the forefront of our minds. It's so hard to not focus on that thing that's causing us to be afraid, right? To have fear then be in the driver's seat of our decision-making because of that. But that isn't what we see happen with David in this psalm, is it? So when faced with fear, do we succumb to it? Do we allow it to run rampant? Or do we, like David, acknowledge those fears? Don't try to run away from them. Don't try to hide from them. Acknowledge them and choose to trust God in spite of them. When we're afraid, it's an opportunity to trust in God, to set our minds on him rather than on the source of our fear. And we can do this because, as David understood, in the face of earthly enemies and fears, our only hope for help is to look to heaven. In God I trust, I shall not be afraid. What can flesh, what can man do to me? David remembers that his unseen God is greater than the tangible threats he is faced with. Though the threats he's facing and the fears along with them are very present and real, he remembers the difference between the temporal and tangible and the eternal and intangible. His enemies may threaten him in the flesh of this life, but ultimately God is in control of both his life and the next. And so he looks to God and he's looking to put his trust in him But even in that, he still desires to be delivered from his enemies and the fear that accompanies these circumstances. And this leads us into the next section. Verses five through 11. All day long they injure my cause. All their thoughts are against me for evil. They stir up strife, they lurk, they watch my steps as they have waited for my life. For their crime will they escape? In wrath cast down the peoples, O God. You have kept count of my tossings. Put my tears in your bottle. Are they not in your book? Then my enemies will turn back in the day when I call. This I know that God is for me. In God whose word I praise. In the Lord whose word I praise. In God I trust I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? So this section begins with even more of a description from David of the ways that his enemies are at work against him. I mean, just reading over verses five and six, you can get a sense of the urgent nature of his predicament, that he is absolutely in danger. But he doesn't linger on listing these things, though, which is worth noting. Instead, he moves his attention back to God, this time asking for God to intervene, looking to him for help. What he's doing here is he's imploring God for help. And this is what we can also do in times of fear. This is the I and sit. Implore him for help. Implore the Lord to help us. David knows that he is helpless in this situation, and so he longs for God to act on his behalf. Verse eight is definitely one that stands out to me in this passage. It's a very vivid description of what seems to be the distress that he is experiencing. Um, You have kept count of my tossings. Put my tears in your bottle. Are they not in your book? It almost reminded me of something that you'd hear in like a sad song on the radio or like a depressing poem, right? It's heart-wrenching. And this word tossings can also be translated as wanderings. It's kind of an interesting word that he's using there. And it's a description meant for us as the reader to think of the distress that David is feeling. We're meant to be feeling it with him. And it could also meant to be helping us to have kind of the visual, um, to bring to mind almost the image of someone who's restless at night, who's so um, afflicted with their fear that they're tossing and turning at night. And the next line furthers this even more when he says, put my tears in your bottle. This is just even more of a picture of the extreme fear and the duress that David is feeling. But this verse here in, in Psalm 56 captures an important truth here that God sees us in our times of fear and distress. He sees us. Nothing that we experience is foreign to him. It's the same idea as the fact that he knows the number of hairs on our heads. Those times that we've been so broken, 
so depressed, so defeated, so fearful that we can't even sleep, that tears are coming. God knows them so well that he keeps count of our tossings. He even collects our tears. He cares deeply for us in those moments. An important aspect of this verse is that despite the uncertainty of David's circumstances, what we see in this passage is that his relationship with God is steadfast. It's a rock to him in the midst of uncertainty. He's not wavering in his trust in the Lord. And we can trust in God in the same way, as a refuge in the midst of life's chaos. Look at what he says in verses nine through 11. This I know that God is for me. I shall not be afraid. What can man do to me? Notice the contrast here between God and man. David knows his enemies, no matter how powerful or threatening they may seem to him at the moment, are mortal. They're finite humans. They stand no chance against the divine, holy, powerful, and infinite God. And he knows which side God is on. He's on his side. He's for David. And this is why he's crying out. He's imploring God for help. I've got a quick illustration, and uh, this kind of made me chuckle as I was thinking of this, and you guys might think it's kind of funny considering this too. So think about it this way. If, if you had two football teams, okay, one, you got me at quarterback, okay? The other team, you've got Patrick Mahomes at quarterback. And then I asked you to pick one team to win. Which team are you picking to win that ball game? It's okay, I won't be offended. Uh, you're, gonna, you're gonna pick the, the team with Patrick Mahomes, right? That's who you want on your team, that's who you want at quarterback leading that team. So David knows that with God, he is on the winning team. His enemies are nothing because his God is bigger and he is secure in him no matter what they do to him. And so the way that this is laid out reminds me so strongly of this New Testament passage. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? If God is for us, who can be against us? That's Romans 8, 31. If we know Jesus, we know that there's a God behind us that's stronger than any enemy we might face and that's greater than any fear haunting us. So we are right to call on him and to implore him to intervene. He is there for us. He's the good shepherd that wants to come to our defense as his precious flock of sheep. In God whose word I praise, in the Lord whose word I praise, in God I trust, I shall not be afraid. What can man do to me? So this is the kind of faith that we can have because of our confidence in the God that's for us. The fear may surround and we might be struggling with it immensely, but in the midst of that, we can trust in God and we cannot be afraid. So why is this true for David? How does he know that he can trust in God as a refuge, as his ultimate security when facing this danger? Because of God's word. Because God says so. He says it right there. He references three times that it's in God whose word he praises that he can trust. And that's why he doesn't need to fear. Because of God's word. So David has his mind set on God. He's implored for him to intervene. Now what? How does he wrap up this psalm as he's facing these enemies? By praising the Lord. By praising God and thanking God him. The third section is verses 12 and 13. I must perform my vows to you, O God. I will render thank offerings to you, for you have delivered my soul from death. Yes, my feet from falling, that I may walk before God in the light of life. So David makes clear with this ending note that God is always worthy of our thanks and praise. He says, I must perform my vows to you, O Lord. I will render thank offerings to you. And thank offerings that he's referencing here can refer to both literal sacrifices made to God as well as songs of gratitude for him. He's singing a song of thanksgiving here. And I think that this is where the way David has faith in the midst of his fears is all the more impressive and that we can learn from. That even as he faces the prospect of death at the hands of his enemies, he is praising God. And not only that, but he's planning ahead for how he can show him his love and his appreciation for his deliverance later on when God helps him escape. He's that confident in the faithfulness of his God. 
So I don't know about you, but for me, it's personally a lot more easy to look back on God and praise him after I've seen him at work in the trial that I'm facing. But David does it in the midst of it. That's why the last piece of what we can learn about facing fear David's way is to thank him for who he is. Thank God for being God, for being on our side, for being so faithful. There's so many things we can say there. The enemy would love for us to respond to fear in a way that distracts us from what our ultimate intended purpose was, to praise God, to live our lives, to bring him glory. As we face fear, it's so important to remember to thank God for who he is, for what he's done, and to praise him for that, even as we call on him for aid. Rather than just sending up an SOS in our distress without any sort of acknowledgement of what God has already done for us and how good he is to us, even in the midst of the trial, that would be such a missed opportunity. If we're just crying out to him for help without giving him any thanks and praise that he's due. For us as followers of Jesus, the act of love shown on the cross is worthy of praise in any and all situations, fear and distress aside. Just as David says here, through Jesus, our souls have been delivered from death through the cross. And God is worthy of our thank offerings and our praise and our adoration because of that truth. One of the neatest parts at the end of this psalm is how David speaks as if God has already triumphed over his enemies. Lord, help us to have that kind of faith as we go through life, as we face circumstances. Help us to pray in that way. This is how the psalm ends. You have delivered my soul from death, yes, my feet from falling, that I may walk before God in the light of life. So thinking about David here, what what reason does David think that God has rescued him? Not just for his own sake, because God was somehow feeling sorry for him in his circumstances, but David sees clearly the purpose that God has for him, that he can live for the Lord, that he can follow his ways, that he can be a man of God, a king of God, who honors the Lord, who loves him. This is truly, as David's described, right? A man who's after God's own heart. And it's true even when he's deeply afraid, even when his enemies are hounding him. His heart is for the Lord and how he can love him and serve him. So as we come to a close this morning and consider this psalm in our own lives, when we're feeling fearful, when we feel our enemies pressing in on us next, We might not be able to right in that moment we're feeling afraid, but at that next opportunity we get, we can look to this psalm. We can open up Psalm 56 and we can just read this and let the Lord work on our fearful hearts. We have so many gut instincts that can take over when we feel that strong pull of fear on our minds. And so instead of succumbing to those, we can take a different approach and we can practice what David does here. God is good and he's bigger than our fears, whether he answers our cries or not. He did for David here, but we may not always get that same outcome. I don't know what fears have been pressing in on you lately, or what may be down the road that you or I will face. Maybe you are indeed facing others who are enemies, who are harassing or taking advantage of you, or there's a very scary health situation affecting you or a loved one or perhaps some financial uncertainties or other life circumstances that are causing you to have much fear. You know what those things are, and you can be encouraged that God knows too. He knows them well, and he wants to come alongside you in that fear. So we've laid out the blueprint to sit like David when we face fear, but I wonder, are there some other ways that we can consider how to respond today this week, some action steps for us. And so we always want to look to the Holy Spirit when thinking about application, but here are some ideas that came to mind that God might prompt you to follow through on in doing. The first one being this. If you're someone who enjoys prayer journaling especially, this might be great, but maybe if you don't really prayer journal, this could be helpful as well. And so it's very practical, but just simply prayer journal Psalm 56 and do it in your own words, okay? Pray on a fear that you struggle with and then you can write out Psalm 56 in a journal but you can paraphrase it and then even consider just putting the fear you're struggling with 
in there for the places where David's talking about his enemies and the fears that he's facing, right? Make it very personal as you're pouring your heart out to the Lord. Just simply pray this same Psalm of David, but make it yours as you're praying it. Or another really simple thing is to share a fear that you have with another trusted believer and not just to share it with them, but to ask them to pray. So share any fears that you might be wrestling with. It's easier said than done, right? It's not always easy for us to open up about those things, but maybe if you've been struggling with it so strongly, having another believer there in it with you, praying for you alongside you, might be something the Lord could use to help you in the midst of that. Because these are the kinds of things that the church is there for, right? To pray for one another, lift up and encourage one another in the challenges that we face. So at the end of the day, our fears may not look exactly like David's, but they are there and they are real. We won't always know what fear is coming or how he might choose to intervene as we implore him to act. But what we do know is the truth of God's presence and his ability to act on our behalf. We know that he's for us because he says it in his word. So when the fears come, we can read Psalm 56 over again and we can pray through it like David. We can remember to sit and lift up our fears to the Lord knowing that he heard David, that he protected him and he delivered him and that he can do the same for us. I wanna close our time this morning by sharing um, a very personal story of a time when myself, um, my wife Michelle and I and our, our family experienced great fear in the face of a troubling circumstance. So it's a story about our oldest child, our, our son Asher, when he was very little. And um, I did ask him about it and he was okay with me coming up here and, and sharing about this story. So when Asher was just a little over a year old, he was 14 months old, um, he passed a kidney stone. And we learned that he had in fact formed multiple stones even beyond the one that he had passed. And so we were left with lots of questions. We were really grasping for answers, um, even as the doctors were having a hard time making sense of why it happened. And so in the end, he was diagnosed with a, a rare genetic disorder that had the potential to be very serious and have lifelong ramifications. And so a series of events led to him then having multiple procedures, including a particular surgery to remove a stone that was causing a blockage. And in that time, too, he had a very difficult week-long stay in the hospital after some post-surgery complications. It just was, was very stressful and challenging and extremely scary. And so in hindsight, what's been clear is that this was an intensely fearful time for us, that Michelle and I were pretty at a loss of what to do and felt very powerless to help little Asher in this journey. And so we might not have been staring down any threatening enemies like David, but we were seeing how our son was facing a very real physical threat to his health, which is one of the greatest fears that you can have as a parent. You moms and dads, you know what I'm talking about. It was leading to a lot of anxiousness, to a lot of uncertainty in us, which the enemy was trying hard to use to bring us down and to discourage us. It left us wondering why a lot. And I'm not sure that we'll ever know the full answer of why this side of eternity. But what we did see was how it greatly deepened our prayer lives, reaching out to others for prayer, so many people that we asked to pray. And ultimately, it stretched our faith and our trust in God to be present with us in the midst of trying times and to deliver us from the most frightening of circumstances. He showed us how he's faithful in that because the story doesn't end there. We were amazed at how the Lord worked and how he responded to so many imploring him to act, so many people lifting Asher up. And to the doctor's amazement, the stones that they and we thought were still there and would need addressed, maybe with future surgeries, one of the times we went to an appointment, um, they were just gone. They were no longer showing up on his, on his scan. Praise God. So he's very healthy now. He remains stone-free, thank the Lord. And he's able to thrive while living with this disease, which, another grace of God, was that it ended up being the least severe form of this condition that he has. So fear can be so hard to navigate, right? David knew this challenge. I've experienced it. You've experienced it. We know the struggle of being afraid. What an amazing joy, though, that in the midst of fear that we have a God who is with us, who is for us, 
and who is far above any enemy or circumstance that would cause us to be afraid. That's the God that we know, the God who is our refuge and our strength, a God who is an ever-present help in our times of need. So the next time we're afraid, we will choose to trust in him. Amen?